The remarkable history of untold cruelty underlining South Africa's early days sprung immensely from the contributions of many historical figures, with Hendrik Verwerd at the forefront of it all. Though a controversial leader, Hendrik Verwerd's actions are still spoken of, and the result thereof is still deeply felt by many South Africans, from generations to generations. Black Journals welcomes you to yet another thought-provoking video today. We're going to be taking a dive at the life of the controversial figure, Hendrik Verwerd, once Prime Minister of South Africa. Verwerd, in his time, was so politically and racially depraved that he was termed the architect of apartheid. He's remembered for his singular role in establishing the system of racial segregation like no one else has ever done in South Africa. In his time, Verwerd was responsible for the displacement of some 80,000 Africans from Sofiatown, Martindale and Nuclear to the newly established townships of southwestern Johannesburg, Soweto. He was also in charge of African education, which he believed should be adapted to the economic life of Africans in South Africa. In reality, this limited the access of black people to the benefits of higher education, good jobs and economic advancement. It was here that he made his infamous statement regarding the limitation of the black academic curriculum to basic literacy and numeracy because Africans were meant to be hewers of wood and drawers of water. But hold on a second. Before we continue on this mind-moving story, don't forget to support our continued efforts by hitting that like button in front of you. Share with your families and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative and kindly subscribe to stay put for more while you keep the channel growing. Your support is immensely valued. Now come with me. Let's start from the start. Hendrik French Vervoerd was born in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, on the 8th of September, 1901. He was the second child of Anja Strick and Wilhelmus Johannes Vervoerd. His father was a shopkeeper and a deeply religious man who decided to move to South Africa in 1903 because of his sympathy towards the Afrikaner nation after the South African War. The Vervoerd's family settled in Winburg, Cape Town for 10 years, after which they moved to Bulawayo, Rhodesia, where the elder Verwerd became an assistant evangelist in the Dutch Reformed Church. After four years, they returned to South Africa and settled in Brantford, in the Orange Free State. However, young Hendrik proved himself to be an able student at the Lutheran School in Winburg and the Winburg High School for Boys. In Rhodesia, Verwerd attended Milton High School where he did so well that he was awarded the Bates Scholarship. After refusing this because of his family's move back to South Africa, he took the matric exam and came first in the Free State and fifth in South Africa. After his schooling, he proceeded to study theology at the University of Stellenbosch, later changing to psychology and philosophy, where he was awarded a master's and a doctorate in philosophy, turning down an Abe Bailey scholarship to Oxford University, England, opting to continue his studies in psychology in Germany. The thing is, Hendrik Verwerd was so excellently schooled that it all adds to make one wonder why such keen mind or intelligence could be so dim or blind as to hate and discriminate and persecute anyone, talk much more a race or collection of people because of the color of their skin. However, the man published a number of works which are all still available at the library of the University of Stellenbosch. He did not stop there. He had continued his studies in the United Kingdom and then proceeded to the United States. His lecture notes and memoranda at Stellenbosch University stressed that there were no biological differences between the big racial groups and concluded that this was not really a factor in the development of a higher social civilization by the Caucasians. Some historians would say that Verwerd's views on race were more likely influenced by his experience of American attitudes towards racial segregation than national socialists in Germany. But why should anybody be influenced against their independent observation and thought? Why should anybody be influenced to hate another because of their color? Verwerd had returned in 1928 to South Africa with his wife whom he had married a year before, and there was appointed to the Chair of Applied Psychology and Psychotechnique at the University of Stellenbosch, where six years later he became Professor of Sociology and Social Work. That was Verwerd. During the Great Depression, which affected many countries across the world during the year 1929 to 1939, Verwerd had become active in social work amongst poor white South Africans. He devoted much attention to welfare work and was often consulted by welfare organizations while he served on numerous committees. And slowly, as though it were all timed, his true colors began slowly coming out onto the surface. Britain African's politics from 1910 to 1948 were divided between the liberals, such as Jan Smuts, who argued for a reconciliation versus the extremists, 
who expressed anti-British sentiments due to the Boer War. Both the liberals and the extremists believed that South Africa was a white man's country, though the extremists were more stridently committed to white supremacy. Verwerd belonged to the anti-British faction in Africans' politics who wanted to keep as much distance as possible from Britain. In 1936, Verwerd, joined by a group of Stellenbosch University professors, protested against the immigration of German Jews to South Africa, who were fleeing Nazi persecution. His efforts in the field of national welfare drew him into politics, and in the year 1936, he was offered the first editorship of Die Transvala, a position which he took up in 1937, with the added responsibility of helping to rebuild the National Party in the Transvaal. Die Transvala was a publication which supported the aspirations of Afrikaner nationalism, agricultural and labor rights. Combining republicanism, populism and protectionism, the paper helped solidify the sentiments of most South Africans that changes to the socio-economic system were vitally needed. With the start of the Second World War in September 1939, Verwood protested against South Africa's role in the conflict when the country declared war on Germany, siding with its former colonial power, the United Kingdom. Verwood, who was a staunch Republican, befriended nationalist leader J.G. Stridham, he also declared himself strongly in favor of racial segregation by attacking the United Party's policy of pampering, leveling, and living together. In 1938, he published a poster condemning mixed marriages depicting a black man and white woman living in poverty. Jews were also sharply criticized as a result of the important professional positions they held, which were seen as a threat to Africaners, a Southern African ethnic group who descended from predominantly Dutch settlers first arriving at the Cape of Good Hope in 1652, and who until 1994 dominated South Africa's politics as well as the country's commercial agricultural sector. During World War II, the Johannesburg Star accused Verwerd's Transvaala of taking a pro-Nazi stand. This prompted him to sue the Star's owners for libel, but the judge ruled against him and accused his newspaper of being helpful to the German propaganda machine. Following the war, his Republican sentiments again manifested themselves in 1947 when he issued instructions to his newspaper staff that they were to ignore the British royal family's visit to South Africa that year. The following year, when the National Party led by Dr. D.F. Malan came into power, he left his position as editor to represent the National Party in the Senate. He rose to cabinet level in 1950 as Minister of Native Affairs. He began to slowly transform the black reservations into autonomous states, that is, Bantustans, which would eventually federate with South Africa. By the powers vested in him, he ruled all the Africans in South Africa and under the Administration Act, he could rule by proclamation. He had the power to issue governing regulations on Africans and to outlaw any African organization, including trade unions that he felt was threatening the African rule. Dr. D.F. Marlin felt that Verwerd was the right man for the job because the Nationalist Party needed someone with his ability and sense of urgency to put apartheid into action. The opposition parties were looking anxiously upon them to see whether the apartheid system would work, and Verwerd was always ready to explain every action to the last detail. At this point in time, Verwerd received many criticisms from opposition parties and even his own people. However, he did not take it lying down. In order to prove to anti-apartheid activists from the opposition parties that the blacks accepted the idea of apartheid, he, for example, fabricated a poem about himself. The poem was in the first issue of the Bantu, a newspaper for blacks. The poem reads, Dr. Verwerd, thou art the shepherd of the black races. Thou art the defender of the Bantu, our rock, our mountain. His opposition were outraged by this poem. However, his reply was that the poem was published without his consent, and it was a reflection of the blacks' appreciation for what he did to them. Teachers in black schools were disgusted by this portrayal of Verwerd because the phrases that were used in this poem are synonymous with the description of sacredness that they taught the students at school. The poem portrayed an image of Verwerd being praised by the black people. Verwerd and his Secretary of Native Affairs, Dr. Willie Max Iselin, shared the same ideologies about black people. Dr. Iselin was an anthropologist and university friend of Verwerd. Their image of blacks was that blacks were tribal people. The white children in school were taught that blacks were not human, but they were above animals in the eyes of God. Verwerd saw a matter of urgency to implement the apartheid plan, and his strategy was to enforce the apartheid system by means of strict laws and regulations. Given the fact that in his authority he ruled by proclamation, he could implement laws on natives as and when he felt like it. 
Though this wasn't correct, he could make proclamations under existing laws, but new laws had to go through Parliament. As Minister of Native Affairs, Verwerd and the Nationalists implemented many laws such as Number 1. The Bantu Authorities Act of 1951 This law gave the various chiefs authority to rule their own people and act as agents for the white government. Verwerd used Mau Mau in Kenya as an example and said that South Africa chiefs should follow his example of tribalism and assisting the white government. Number 2. The Suppression of Communism Act of 1950 this act was implemented to ban any organization that the government found to be influenced or inspired by communism to be outlawed. The act was used as a tool to ban any opposition or anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. Number 3. Criminal Laws Amendment Act of 1953 Under this law, Verwood assured that no opposition would be able to oppose the government's decisions in any way without finding themselves on the wrong side of the law. Oppositions ended up being either banned or banished. Number 4. The Bantu Education Act of 1955 This act gave the government lots of authority over black schools, including political power. The act prohibited anti-apartheid activities in schools and allowed for students to be suspended if they participated in such activities. Verwood dictated education of blacks, and this was eminent in one of his speeches. I will reform it so that natives will be taught from childhood to realize that equality with Europeans is not for them. Racial relations cannot improve if the wrong type of education is given to natives. They cannot improve if the result of native education is the creation of a frustrated people who have expectations in life which circumstances in South Africa do not allow to be fulfilled. He was that cold and unfeeling towards the people of color. Number 5. The Native Labor Relations Act Black workers could not enjoy the same labor rights as their white counterparts. Under this law, it was determined that blacks are not to be equally treated as white workers in the workplace. This simply meant black workers had no rights and had to follow whatever his white boss had ordered them to do. The act was an enactment of the Master and Servant Act. Number 6. The Natives Act. Under the Natives Act, the abolition of passes and coordination of documents were determined. Commonly known as Die Dompus Wet, requested that blacks should wear their pass at all times and on request they should produce it. In the event that you didn't have your pass then, you could be detained and sent to the Bantu states. And the seventh, the Urban Areas Act. Under this act, Verwerd was able to override any decision made by local officials. He had total control over what the blacks could and could not do. He could outlaw any organization that he did not feel comfortable with. As in relations with all the other acts, Verwerd has given himself legitimate power to extend his apartheid ideology. Verwood assured that the vision of Africanism was fulfilled by making sure that the needs of the Afrikaners were met as he had promised them. By means of legislation and tactful strategies, he increased white employment, produced cheap black labor, and introduced total segregation. The eight years of Verwood administration were like a living hell for Africans and it increased the mood of rebellion amongst Africans. Verwood is often attributed the title of architect of apartheid, because of the policies he put into practice during his time as Minister of Native Affairs and as Prime Minister of the Republic of South Africa. Apartheid was however a partial legacy of British colonialism that introduced a system of pass laws in the Cape Colony. However, he was responsible for considerably expanding the apartheid system and creating the modern version of apartheid. Verwerd became Prime Minister in 1958 after the death of J.G. Stridham, realizing his Republican dream two years later when a white referendum supported his plea for a republic. This was also the first time in 12 years of government that the National Party was able to gain a majority in the white electorate. The opposition United Party and many English-speaking whites of British descent were opposed to a republic, but once again, Verwerd changed the law to his advantage. He lowered the voting age for whites to 18 and allowed whites in Southwest Africa to vote. On the 5th of October 1960, a referendum was held in which white voters were asked, Do you support a republic for the Union? 52% voted yes. The government under Streedham had brought in a rule requiring the government to seek a two-thirds approval of the electorate before carrying out a constitutional change, but this rule was ignored. Verwood barely managed to cross the 50% threshold. He persuaded many South Africans that given Harold Macmillan's Winds of Change speech and international condemnation following the Sharpeville massacre, South Africa would have to go it alone by becoming a republic. 
Many South Africans of English origin voted for the change believing that South Africa would remain in the Commonwealth, suggesting that there may have been significant numbers of Afrikaners opposed to the change, given that they made up a much larger proportion of the voting population. Verwoerd also managed to persuade them by keeping the system of government almost exactly the same, except that the president would be chosen by both houses. The refinement of apartheid into a separate but equal policy can be attributed to Verwoerd, who strongly advocated a theory of separate nations. He argued that contact between groups would hinder their evolution into independent nationhood. His willingness to guide black people to self-determination once he considered them ready won him many new white supporters. He promised that the different tribal nations living in the Republic would be given equal political rights in their own homelands. This represented a radical swing in National Party policy, as previous leaders D.F. Marlin and J.G. Streedham had preached a naked form of white racism and buscap, that is, paternalistic domination, in order to retain whites in a position of power. As a result of the repressive laws, rebellions broke out in some rural reservations, and strikes and riots occurred in the main industrial areas. Verwood's answers to these were bans, banishments, arrests, and the enactment of increasingly harsh laws. Some of the most restrictive laws were pass laws. These laws forced black South Africans to carry special identification that police and other authorities could check at any time. The government used passes to restrict where black South Africans could work, live and travel. Similar laws had existed before apartheid, but under apartheid they became much worse. Pass laws were used to confine the black population to specific black-only settlement areas. They were also used to control and exploit black workers, who could be forced to live far away from their homes and families. Millions of black South Africans were arrested, jailed, and severely brutalized under the authority of these bedeviling repressive laws. For years, many South Africans peacefully protested against apartheid laws, including the pass system. In March 1960, a group called the Pan-African Congress, PACI, decided to organize a protest in the black township of Sharpville. The plan was for protesters to march to the local police station without their passes and ask to be arrested in an act of civil disobedience. On March 21, thousands of South Africans marched to the Sharpville police station. They gathered in peaceful defiance, refusing to carry their passbooks. They chanted freedom songs and shouted, Down with passes! Simon Makutau, who participated in the protest, later recalled saying, The atmosphere was cheerful, people were happy, singing and dancing. However, as time went by, more and more police began to appear, along with increasing numbers of armored vehicles. Military jets began to fly overhead. Then, without warning, the police opened fire on the unarmed crowd. I'd rather not go into details here, but it was historically nothing short of bloody. With 83 killed and 365 wounded, a state of emergency was declared, and the African National Congress, ANC, and the Pan-Africanist Congress, PAC, were banned. Verwer dismissed the international and internal rejection of apartheid. His apparent failure to perceive the abhorrence his policies aroused among civilized nations was best described in his own words when, shortly after the Sharpville mass killings, Verwer addressed a cheering crowd of white supporters, reassuring them that the black masses of South Africa were in support of the government and administration of the country and were also peace-loving and orderly. Verwer heavily repressed opposition to apartheid during his premiership, he ordered the detention and imprisonment of tens of thousands of people and the exile of further thousands, while at the same time greatly empowering, modernizing, and enlarging the white apartheid state's security forces, police, and military. While he banned black organizations such as the African National Congress and the Pan-Africanist Congress, it was in his regime that future President Nelson Mandela was imprisoned for life for sabotage. Verwood South Africa had one of the highest prison populations in the world, and saw a large number of executions and floggings. By the mid-1960s, Verwerd's government to a large degree had put down internal civil resistance to apartheid by employing extraordinary legislative power, draconian laws, psychological intimidation, and the relentless efforts of the white state's security apparatus. Although apartheid began in 1948 with D.F. Milan's premiership, Verwerd's role in expanding and legally entrenching the system including his theoretical justifications and opposition to the limited form of integration known as BASCAP, have led him to be described as the architect of apartheid. On April 9, 1960, a deranged white farmer shot Verwood in an assassination attempt that failed. Six years later, on September 6, 1966, 
Verwood was stabbed to death in the parliamentary chamber by a temporary parliamentary messenger, Dimitrio, also known as Dimitri Tsafendas, a Mozambique immigrant of mixed descent. He initially blamed his actions on instructions he had received from a giant tapeworm in his stomach, was found to be insane, and was confined to prison or a mental asylum for the rest of his life. Later interviews with Safendus revealed that the assassination was motivated by the great resentment he felt toward the arbitrary racial classifications and policies of apartheid, which had adversely affected his life. On the 50th anniversary of Verwood's assassination in 2016, some in South Africa argued that Safendus should be regarded as an anti-apartheid hero. Many major roads, places and facilities in cities and towns of South Africa were named after Verwerd, but in post-apartheid South Africa there has been a campaign to take down statues of Verwerd and rename buildings and streets named after him. Famous examples include HF Verwerd Airport in Port Elizabeth, renamed Port Elizabeth Airport, the Verwerd Dam in the Free State, now the Garriop Dam, HF Verwerd Academic Hospital in Pretoria, now Steve Biko Hospital, and the town of Verwoordburg, now Centurion. Further speaking, Verwood's legacy in South Africa today is a controversial one. As for black South Africans, Verwood was and is still regarded as the epitome of evil, the white supremacist who was so racially depraved that he became a symbol of apartheid itself. However, while most white South Africans now speak of Verwood as an embarrassment, a minuscule few still praise him. In 2004 even, Verwood was elected by popular poll as one of the top 20 South Africans of all time in a certain TV show, Great South Africans. In closing, Verwood's legacy serves as a stark reminder of the dangers of racial prejudice and the importance of upholding human rights for all. The struggle against apartheid continues to inspire movements for social justice around the world. We must remain vigilant in confronting all forms of discrimination and work towards a future where everyone has equal opportunities to thrive. That brings us to the end of this video. While we hope you've learned a few things, do kindly support our works by hitting that like button, share with your families and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening narratives, and subscribe so you don't miss out on any. Thank you for staying with us.